Hi, it's Dr. Amy from Kinder. Welcome to the second video in the series on COVID-19 as of the middle of March. In the last video, we reviewed a little bit about pandemics around the world, why the fast spread through healthy people of COVID-19 has been a problem, and why having the critical population that need extra support, having them present very quickly in a short amount of time, have overwhelmed some healthcare systems around the world and might do that in the US as well. But before we talk more about exactly what we can do right now um, to hopefully make that a little bit better, let's talk about who are the actual vulnerable people to the worst outcomes. How does testing work? What's been our problem with testing in the US? And how does that affect our treatment, our containment? And what are the treatments, if any, as of today? So this is a breakdown of mortality rate by age in decades from China. The majority of data on people who have died from COVID-19 are still from China. But emerging numbers from other hard hit countries seem to hold that the risk in young people are not non-existent, but they're much lower. By and large, the elderly and people of all ages with prior conditions are most at risk. Now, the data so far shows that cardiovascular conditions and diabetes are two of the biggest clusters that lead to bad outcomes with COVID-19. As a pediatrician, I've been heartened and um, glad to see that so far COVID-19 has not been that bad for kids in the sense that globally, the WHO does not report death under the age of 10. And even kids who've tested positive and have signs of disease on CT have actually no symptoms and they do very well in recovery. This is actually not the case in the flu and in some of the other pandemics around the world where children have been one of the very vulnerable populations but this does not seem to be the case so far with COVID-19 and kids have been spared. The thought is that they have a particularly robust Th2 cytokine reaction that can halt the disease early and prevent bad outcomes. So while this is good news for kids and parents and for me as a pediatrician, the other flip side of this is to remember that kids are the perfect vectors for this disease. They can carry it for weeks with no symptoms Along with other young, healthy people, um, they can interact with a lot of people at large and then become a vector to then reach somebody who's vulnerable, who might catch COVID-19 from that chain of infections. So this time quarantining young, healthy people, seemingly healthy people, is not as much for their own protection as it is to protect our community at large and to try to flatten that curve of how sharply the cases will arise and how concentrated the critical cases will hit the hospitals. So one common question I've gotten is, what about kids with asthma? That's a, one of the most common prior conditions that kids have. And as you know, when they have the flu or the cold, anything viral, um, asthma can flare. So the answer to this so far is we don't actually know from an evidence point of view because there haven't been enough really sick kids. So not enough to, for us to know okay, how exactly does asthma play into the picture. But presumably, you know, it's a virus that affects the respiratory system that leads to cough and asthma usually makes that picture worse. So I would say for now, there's no reason to change the baseline asthma action plan that you probably have with your pediatrician when it comes to if they catch a cold. And I would do the same sick plan that is already in place. So now knowing that this is how the risk sort of breaks down so far, how do we know who actually has it? In this pandemic so far, we've seen pretty wide variations in how different countries are offering testing or having availability of testing. We won't get too much into the particulars of why exactly this happened and point fingers because we can't change the past right now. But what's happened in the US is that there has been, as of today, a big shortage in the amount of tests that we do have. So as a doctor, we need to get permission from the health department to test patients. And the lack of enough tests for everybody has made it very difficult. So for every one positive, um, patient that we have, there are untold numbers of positive infections that we just have no way of testing right now. So the thought is that will change soon and the private sector is working hard to um, set up community testing places. Exactly when that will be, I have not heard any particulars, but hopefully that gets going soon. That gives us a more realistic idea of how many people are actually affected. So what does that mean for us? Um, by and large, so far, it doesn't actually affect treatment that much, and I'll explain why. And I know, by the way, it's very frustrating if you or your loved one is having these symptoms and you're scared and you want to get tested and you're being told and turned away by everybody that you can't get tested. But the one thing I can reassure you is that the treatment so far has been largely supportive, meaning 
things like giving oxygen or help with breathing, even a breathing tube. Those are clinical decisions. A doctor decides by looking at how sick you are and how much you're struggling to breathe and so forth. So whether you test positive or negative shouldn't affect whether you get that support. Now, there are some cases where doctors are saying if you have COVID-19, maybe they'll help you with a breathing tube earlier. But that's more of the nuance of clinical treatment, which we as a medical community are still figuring out. But by and large, supportive treatment means it's your clinical condition that determines what kind of support you get. So in that way, testing is not affecting who gets what treatment. There are a few experimental drugs, including uh, medicines that have been used on Ebola and malaria that are being tested. The use for those medicines are very experimental, so we're finding out more about the efficacy. So hopefully as we learn more about and can use them in more patients, hopefully the testing also ramps up so we can start giving them to more patients. So if it doesn't drive whether or not you need support or treatment, what does it drive? Now, testing is important on a public health level to know who to isolate. Examples of countries who have done well with this include Taiwan, South Korea, Germany, where there's an abundant free testing so that as soon as you test positive, even if the symptoms are mild or have no symptoms, people can isolate and stop the spread. As it is, we currently don't know how many mildly sick people actually have the virus. So that's why the shutdown rules would have to be more universal and widely practiced in order to make a real difference. So again, like we said in the last video, isolating young people or universally shutting down things is to protect the vulnerable people who will get sick around the same time and overwhelm our health system. And of course, for young people, the risk is not zero. And we do see some people in their 20s and 30s with no prior conditions who've had some bad outcomes. So in the end, it protects everybody. And the shortage of precise testing so far does mean that our lockdown needs to be more universal to be effective. So next we'll talk about social distancing. Exactly how do we do this? It's a very critical window right now and whether or not we're able to successfully distance ourselves can make a big impact in delaying or you know, containing, flattening the highest peak of this pandemic. So I'll see you in the next video.